The JFK 35 podcast is produced by the JFK Library Foundation and made possible with the help of a generous grant from the Blanche and Irving Laurie Foundation. He comes through not as the caricature that you see, the celebrity icon. That What's interesting is you see the origins of that. You see the, the fighting, the drinking, you know, those sorts of things. But you also see his sense of humor, his uh, concern for family and friends, his willingness to loan anybody money. And he was constantly loaning people money and never getting paid back. And his, uh, you know, you see how he's politically astute. In 2011, the first volume of the Ernest Hemingway Letters Project was published. This May, the sixth volume is being released in this project to create a comprehensive edition of author Ernest Hemingway's correspondence. In this episode of JFK 35, I talk to two of the project's editors about Ernest Hemingway and his letters. We also take a brief look at Kennedy's and Hemingway's letters home during wartime. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm Jamie Richardson, and welcome to this episode of JFK 35. The John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum is a place where people can come to learn about President Kennedy's life and times. It's also the principal place of research on Ernest Hemingway. Check out our podcast page for a link to the story of how Hemingway's papers landed at the JFK Library. Both Kennedy and Hemingway are larger than life, and loom large not for just Americans, but for many around the world. They had very different careers and personalities, but they had similarities as well. In particular, they both experienced war firsthand as young men. JFK served in the Pacific on a PT boat in World War II, and Hemingway drove a Red Cross ambulance in Italy in World War I. Both were injured and wrote home to their families about the experience. For JFK, the PT boat he commanded had been destroyed and the crew was presumed dead. Once he was rescued, he wrote to his family, Dear folks, this is just a short note to tell you that I am alive and not kicking, in spite of any reports that you may happen to hear. It was believed otherwise for a few days, so reports or rumors may have gotten back to you. Fortunately, they misjudged the durability of a Kennedy, and I'm back at the base now and am okay. As soon as possible, I shall try to give you the whole story. Much love to you all, Jack. Ernest Hemingway, just shy of his 20th birthday, was injured by Austrian mortar shells while he was driving on the Italian front. In a letter home after his injury, he made a similar observation that JFK had in his letter home. When the first volume of the Letters of Hemingway was published, the JFK Library held a discussion on Hemingway's early life. Actor Corey Stoll, who had portrayed Hemingway in the film Midnight in Paris, read this letter to his family. I would like to come home and see you all, of course, but I can't until after the war is finished. And that isn't going to be such an awfully long length of time. There's nothing for you to worry about, because it's been fairly conclusively proved that I can't be bumped off. Hemingway also offered a reflection on death and dying. Dying is a very simple thing. I've looked at death, and really, I know. If I should have died, it would have been very easy for me, quite the easiest thing I ever did. But the people at home do not realize that. They suffer a thousand times more. When a mother brings a son into the world, She must know that someday the son will die. And the mother of a son that has died for his country should be the proudest woman in the world and the happiest. And how much better to die in all the happy period of undisillusioned youth, to go out in a blaze of light, than to have your body worn out and old and illusions shattered. So dear old family, don't ever worry about me. It isn't bad to be wounded. I know because I've experienced it. And if I die, I'm lucky. Does all that sound like the crazy wild kid you sent out to learn about the world a year ago? It is a great old world, though, and I've always had a good time. And the odds are all in favor of coming back to the old place. But I thought I'd tell you how I felt about it. Now I'll write you a nice, cheerful, bunky letter in about a week, so don't get low over this one. (laughs) I love you all, Ernie. Now, 13 years after the first volume came out, the sixth volume of The Letters of Hemingway is about to be published. Joining me now are two of the editors of The Letters of Hemingway Project, Verna Kale and Sandra Spanier. Sandra, Verna, thank you for joining me. Thank you. It's great to be here. 
And so this is the sixth volume of Ernest Hemingway's letters in a series of 17. The first book was published in 2011. How did the project come about? And then how far back did it go even before that, before the first volume was released? Well, it was uh, it was a long time in the making before the first volume came out in print. I was contacted in 2002 at a time when the, it had been decided, Patrick Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway's son, had decided that he wanted to have his father's complete collected letters in a full scholarly edition, not a collection or a selection of letters, but complete comprehensive edition. And the Ernest Hemingway Foundation, which also has a stake in the letters, and the Ernest Hemingway Estate decided that the time had come to do this. And so I was given the opportunity to be in charge of this project. And it's a huge honor to do it. It's also, it was a, a rather uh, enormous task to take on because the letters were scattered everywhere. We didn't have a publisher. Um, I needed to secure some institutional support. I'm a professor at Penn State University, and and fortunately, my dean was was very supportive of this idea. So the first challenge was to find the letters. Uh, we knew that the Kennedy Library had the world's largest collection of letters, so that was a an obvious place to start. And, and I have to say the Kennedy Library has been incredibly supportive of this project from day one and very generous and terms of supplying copies and answering our endless questions, uh, supplying photographs. But we did uh, amass over several years a central archive of letters, and we have located letters in some 250 different locations. And those include more than 70 libraries and institutional repositories, then private collections, uh, both from people who had corresponded with Hemingway himself, family members of, of Ernest Hemingway, people who are are just collectors of, of books and manuscripts and autographs. So it, they're also, we keep careful track of what letters are on the market um, through dealers, through auction houses. So there's a lot of detective work that went into just simply getting uh, the core archive. And then we needed to find a publisher and we sent out a prospectus to several places, and and we were fortunate that Cambridge University Press uh, offered us the contract for this project. And there are actually very few presses who want to take on a multi-year sort of open-ended project like this. And at the time, too, it was uh, there was a stipulation that it only be print copies, and uh, so this was also a bit of a stumbling block at the beginning. Since volume five, I should hasten to add, we are now printing electronically simultaneously with, with the print volumes. So it, it did, it took several years to find the letters, collect the letters. They had to be transcribed. So we knew how many words we were dealing with, because if you're just counting letters, you're counting a five word cable as a letter and you're counting a 10 page single space typewritten letter as a letter. So we really had to get the archive. We had to figure out how to accession each document in a way that would be, um, we'd be able to retrieve them all. There was a lot of, of sorting, building up a database. So there was a lot of behind the scenes work before we could even think about publishing the first volume. And, and our publisher wanted us to not to start publishing until we felt pretty sure that we had found as many as we were likely to find. Now, we'll talk later about letters that have surfaced since then. We were all re almost ready to go, um, I think around 2008 or nine, when we um, got access to a collection of more than 100 family letters that had been in the possession of one of Hemingway's nephews, Ernie Mainland of Petoskey, Michigan. And that included some 40 letters that belonged in volume one. So we had to say, stop everything and incorporate those letters. We also discovered that at the Kennedy Library, you have um, these scrapbooks that Grace Hemingway kept for Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway, as she did for each of her six children. And we realized that there are letters in the scrapbooks that 
Grace Hemingway, Hemingway's mother had had pasted in there that we hadn't taken into account because they don't show up on the finding aid as a letter. So it it took a while for us to really feel confident that we uh, did have as many as we were likely to find. So the volume one came out in, in 2011 and we are now publishing volume six and we that brings us up to June of 1936. So excellent. I know I can imagine that feeling of like, okay, we're going to print and then like, oh no, here's this like treasure chest of more more things. That's wonderful. Um, and Verna, when did you join the project and what has the process been like for you? I first um, joined the Letters Project, I think in 2005, as a research assistant when I was a grad student at Penn State. So I, I was able to to be involved in the early phases of the project when we were still locating, identifying, dating, making initial transcriptions of those letters. And then, you know, I, I got my PhD and went away for a while. And then I was fortunate enough to be able to come back in 2017 as associate editor of the Letters Project. And at that time, volume four was just about to be published. And so I've been involved with volumes five and six, and I'm co-editor with Sandy and with Miriam B. Mandel of volume six, which will be out in May. Wonderful. And then you kind of touched on this with the scrapbooks and Hemingway's nephew, but were there copies of letters that either surprised or you didn't know existed or something that you had heard about, but wasn't sure if there was proof of it? Um, we, we sometimes do find letters in unexpected or interesting places. Um, and I, I think that one of the most interesting is actually one of the letters that you have at JFK. It's just a little fragment of a piece of paper and, we kind of puzzled over, you know, what is this torn off fragment? It's very interesting. It seems to be, you know, some kind of uh, gossipy statement. And just looking at the letter and the physical object, looking at the marks on the page where it had been torn, we were kind of able to put two and two together and figure out that it had been torn away from another letter that, or from the same letter that the other part of that letter is located at the University of South Carolina. Um, and that's one of the letters that's going to appear in volume six. And it, it's really interesting because the, the letter that he sent to Arnold Gingrich, which is in the collection at the University of South Carolina, is talking about F. Scott Fitzgerald. Gingrich had apparently really enjoyed meeting Fitzgerald, and Hemingway had some kind of unkind things to say, and I think he regretted it and didn't want to didn't want to say that in the letter he sent to Fitzgerald, and so he ripped that part off, sent the letter, sent the letter to Gingrich, put the the unkind things about Fitzgerald, you know, in a desk or something. Then later that gets rolled into his papers, collected, and that's how the little fragment ended up at JFK. And so it's it's not so much finding something unexpected as solving the little interesting mysteries like that, where we're able to say, oh, you know, I think this, I think this might be about Fitzgerald. And oh, I think, you know, I think these page edges match and then holding the the two scans up to each other and being able to say yeah you know part of it is in one place part of it is in another because the Hemingway archive is so big and parts of it are scattered around and just being able to put the puzzle pieces together for me is the the surprising and fun part. That's some incredible detective work and I know from past interviews we've had um, about Hemingway he didn't throw anything out so I imagine there's you, yeah, you probably could keep finding things and finding putting those scraps together. That's amazing. Um, oh, and then Sandra, you have to oh. work on, on Verna's part to notice that the little chip at the edge of, of one page matched up with the little chip at the end of, of, of another page. So it, yeah, the, that Hemingway kept everything. We are so lucky for that, that he, he didn't throw away his, his outtakes, he kept them. And sometimes he'd put them in an envelope and write unsent across the front because he would, think better of writing something, um, but he didn't throw it away. And okay. one other surprising place that we find things is in other people's stuff. So Hemingway was, you know, famous early on, and he also attracted the attention of critics and professors within his own lifetime. And so sometimes 
original letters are gone, but we'll find transcriptions of them. So for example, in the papers of Charles Fenton, one of Hemingway's earliest biographers, in the papers of Carlos Baker, who edited the selected letters, which was, you know, up until this project, the the main volume of letters where you could read Hemingway's stuff. And so we'll we'll sometimes the only surviving text of a letter is quoted in another letter or in someone's notes or a news article, something like that. And that that's also kind of a fun and exciting thing to run across because those things haven't always shown up in the finding aids. Another thing too, is that people will contact us out of the blue because they've heard about the project and we have found that almost every time a volume comes out that generates some correspondence with someone who has a relative who had a Hemingway letter. So uh, volume six includes um, a letter to Adrian Williams. Uh, and we received just again, out of the blue, a an email saying uh, from the grandson of Adrian Williams, um, who uh, wrote to us, uh, my grandfather, Adrian Williams started as a soda jerk and ended up tending bar in Miami for Hemingway later, at least according to family lore. And what had happened was that Hemingway, uh, Ernest Hemingway and Pauline and their son Patrick were driving from their home in Key West, Florida, to Pauline's home in Piggott, Arkansas. And they they passed through a small town in Florida. And Adrian Williams, uh, recognized Hemingway and asked him to autograph a copy of the brand new issue of Esquire magazine uh, that had a piece by Hemingway in it. And so he had the autograph. And then apparently he wrote to Hemingway again. And we have a letter that was sent to us then by the, the grandson in which Hemingway says, sure, I remember writing on the January Esquire for you. Uh, yeah, I remember meeting you and that, that, uh, I don't know if it was a soda shop or a diner or what. And uh, he also mentioned, and it's very sweet because he says, if we come through Ocala again, I'll look you up. I'm not sure that ever happened, but it that's a pretty gracious thing for a very famous writer to do, to respond to someone who had just come up to him while he was eating a meal with his family. So that, that was totally unknown, unexpected out of the blue. Wow. And that's happened that's so, yeah. more than once. <laughs> wow. Um, so really, you mentioned this earlier, Sandra, and this kind of relates to this. Um, you said that this volume has an appendix of earlier letters. So is that kind of where this is the reason you have the appendix is you keep getting more letters from people saying, oh, yeah, I have this and you have to go back and add them in? That's right. Well, we had always known that, that this would happen to some extent. And we had always planned that the last volume would have an appendix of earlier letters. But we began to realize we were accumulating a critical mass of these letters. And given how, what a long-term project this is, it's going to be in the 2040s before we get to the last volume. And people would rather know that information now rather than then. So Verna can talk in, in more detail about the appendix. But we did, we talked with our publisher and they agreed that it would be a good idea to, now that we do have a critical mass, to included in this volume. And then periodically, we will likely do the same throughout the edition. Yeah, the, the appendix contains, you know, exactly the the kind of thing you were just talking about when, you know, someone finds a letter that belonged to a, a, a relative. Um, so for example, the granddaughter of one of Hemingway's high school classmates found some letters from Hemingway to her grandmother after her grandmother passed away. Um, and so those letters are, are in the appendix. We also find them, though, in, in a couple other ways. Uh, as Sandy mentioned, we keep an eye on auctions. And so sometimes a, a letter comes up for auction. It had been previously unknown, or, or maybe we knew about it, but old auction catalogs only identified it by date. The latest auction will will actually, you know, have a, an image of the letter where we can see it and and verify the text. But also just improvements in technology in the past, you know, 20 years have really helped us find more letters because when the project began, we received, 
you know, printouts and microfilm and things like that. And now a lot of things are being digitized. And so there's a letter in the appendix from a digitized newspaper. So in 1923, Hemingway wrote uh, a letter to a sports columnist that got published in one of the English language Paris newspapers. And that paper's been digitized. And so we were able to find that letter. Libraries have been digitizing their finding aids, or they've even just been digitizing their materials. And sometimes, you know, places don't really realize that what they have would be considered correspondence. So substantive inscriptions, postcards, that kind of thing. And so there's, I'm happy to say there's, there's actually not a lot of stuff in the appendix. I, I'm I'm pretty pleased to note that the the letters project team has done a good job finding the Hemingway letters. But there are I think 48 items total in the in the appendix, and some of them are actually we did previously publish them, but only in excerpt. And then the uh, the complete letter has has been located, and so a few of those items are actually just completion of a previously fragmentary letter. But I think it's really interesting. It goes, the appendix covers 1918 to 1934. And so in terms of reading it straight through chronologically, it's a little bewildering because you're covering that much time in only a few pages. But they, the appendix does add a few more interesting nuggets to our knowledge of Hemingway. Awesome. And then I wanted to talk a bit about what's in the book itself and kind of stepping back, a step back for a second. You mentioned technology changing so much and communication, the way we communicate today is vastly different from Hemingway's time. And the idea of sitting down to write a letter, I hate to say, is kind of antiquated. But can you talk about the types of letters he was writing or how or where he'd write the kind of occasions? Who's he, who's he writing to? Well, he, he had a vast array of correspondence. Um, we know now that over the course of his whole life, we have some more than 6,000 letters that we've located. And those are to more than, well, nearly 2,000 different correspondents in volume six proper, not counting the appendix. We have uh, 366 letters to 116 correspondents. And there are a few people who get a lot of letters. Up until this volume, his most frequent correspondent has been Maxwell Perkins, his editor at Scribner's. In this volume, we actually have someone else pulling ahead of Maxwell Perkins as the first most prominent correspondent, and that's Arnold Gingrich, who was the editor of Esquire magazine. And from the very first issue of Esquire in the fall of 1933, Hemingway was their top build correspondent and contributor. So it's kind of interesting that he wrote so frequently to Arnold Gingrich, who was a, a young man, and, and Hemingway kind of took a mentoring role with him to some extent. Perkins is still very heavily represented, but also among the top people in this volume are Jane Mason, who is a friend. People would describe her as a socialite. I don't know that I like that description, but she was a, a patron of the arts. She was married at the time to Grant Mason, who was the head of Pan American Airways, uh, they lived in this beautiful mansion in Havana uh, called Jamanitas. And Hem the Hemingway is both Ernest and, and his wife Pauline at the time and the Masons were, were friends with each other. There's some debate as to whether the relationship between Ernest and Jane was more than that. But there are, she's the third most heavily represented correspondent in the volume and shortly or Close behind her with 18 letters is Sarah Murphy. Sarah and Gerald Murphy were prominent figures in the expatriate circles in Paris and in the south of France. They serve as partial prototypes to Nicole and Dick Diver in F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, Tender is the Night. And they were very much at the heart of a circle that included Hemingway, Fitzgerald, John Dos Passos, and Archibald MacLeish, and, and other figures of the time. So they kept up a very warm friendship, Hemingway and Sarah in particular. And beyond that, he's writing to family members. He's writing to aspiring young writers. Uh, there's someone named Joseph Hopkins, who he writes quite a few letters to. And this is just a, a young man who wrote to him to ask for writing advice. And in a very a great spurt of generosity, Hemingway really wrote 
a lot of substantive letters to the, to this young man. He was writing to Pierre Matisse, who ran an art gallery in Manhattan because Hemingway wanted to sponsor an exhibition of etchings by a Spanish artist, Luis Quintanilla, who at the time was jailed in Madrid. He was for political reasons. So it, it's just all over the map. Uh, uh, sports people, a fishing columnist for the Miami Herald, and then just fans who wrote to him occasionally, he would he would respond. So it, it's John Dos Passos, F. Scott Fitzgerald, you, you can kind of over from volume to volume trace the ebb and flow of some of these literary friendships. So there are a lot fewer to F. Scott Fitzgerald now than there were at the heyday of their friendship in the mid-20s. Although Fitzgerald is definitely a subject of some worried letters between Hemingway and, and others who knew him. And this book covers, or this volume has letters from June 1934 to June 1936. So where was Hemingway in his personal life, in his professional life at this point in time? I think that this is a really pleasant volume to read in a lot of ways because it's it's a happy time for him. This is the period right after he has gotten his own boat, the Pilar, and he has really embraced the sport of deep sea fishing. And, you know, he's he's writing a lot about the, the various fish that he's catching and these fishing expeditions that he's going on. And so that's an exciting time for him. It's a time of discovery and of learning. You know, Hemingway was this kind of autodidact. And so he's he's just learning as much as he can about that sport. And then not coincidentally, I think it's also a, a time of creative activity for him. So the the physical activity and the creative activity, that energy, they you see in these letters how that kind of feeds he, you know, the two things feed off each other. And he's writing a lot. He's he's just finished Green Hills of Africa, his book about his African safari. And he's working on other short stories. He's writing all of those pieces for Esquire magazine. So he's like regularly churning out these pieces, which he does take pretty seriously. He writes two of his best short stories during this time period, um, The Short Happy Life of Francis McComber and Snows of Kilimanjaro, as well as a few other lesser well-known stories. And so he repeatedly in these letters is describing the time as a belle epoch, so a beautiful era of creative expression where um, he's just feeling a lot of energy. And then he's got, you know, the the activity that Sandy mentioned, you know, working with these artists to promote them. So in addition to Luis Quintanilla, he's promoting the work of a Cuban painter, Antonio Gatorno. Um, and, you know, he's also, you know, he's a family man at this time. He's got his two sons, Patrick and Gregory, living with him, and he likes to take them out fishing. And then on school vacations, he has his older son, Bumby, from his first marriage to Hadley, uh, who comes over. And so, you know, he likes to take the boys on trips. And so, you know, it's a, it's a time where he's mostly in you know, Key West, Cuba, Bimini. So he's not traveling extensively as we maybe have seen in other volumes. He's more at home, but he's at home and at sea. And it's just an energetic, interesting time for him. And are there any of the favorite letters, either from this volume or other letters that you've come across that kind of speak to you or tell you more about Hemingway or, or that were a surprise for him? I I have a, a clear favorite in this volume. It, it it's one of my favorite all-time letters by Hemingway, and it's uh, it's actually it's a very sad letter, and I think it it shows the side of him that maybe people don't know so much about about him being uh, a caring person and a supportive friend. But uh, Sarah Murphy, who who Sandy had had been talking about earlier, Hemingway uh, was friends with Sarah and Gerald Murphy, and their son Bayoth suddenly became very sick, and Hemingway had rushed Sarah in the Pilar 
to Miami so that she could fly home to be with her son while he was in the hospital. And unfortunately, Bayoth didn't survive his illness. He he died of an infection. And Hemingway was really rocked by this emotionally. Like it was it was a shock to him that that his friends had lost a child who was close in age to, you know, his own children. And he wrote her this letter of condolence where he told her, no one you love is ever dead. And he writes about um, just the way she can face this this horrible loss. And he says about him having to die so young, he is spared from learning what sort of place the world is. It's your loss. So it's something you can be brave about. And to me, that really shows that Hemingway believed a lot of the, you know, the stuff he writes in his fiction about bravery and grace under pressure and all, all of that stuff. Like he's, he really lives up to that. And he offers that as a message of condolence to Sarah and really understands the, the terrible loss that she has faced and the letter itself that, that she had received. She actually annotated that letter and, and wrote something on it. Like, Oh, this is the the wonderful letter. I think it's. I think she says wonderful, you know, received after after she lost her son. And I just find that that particular letter so touching. That's lovely, and uh, Sandra. Do you have a favorite or favorites? Probably my favorite of all time is in uh, the first volume where Ernest and Hadley have just come to Paris, and he's writing to his mother back in in Oak Park, Illinois, about just what it's like to be there, that they're living in the, the poorest quarter of Paris and they have a, a good batch of friends. And then he says, Paris is so very beautiful that it satisfies something in you that's always hungry in America. And you know, for a 23 year old, that's, I, I find that just very moving. Um, he goes on, it's pretty funny to say um, that Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas had come over the night before to dinner, and she's very large and very nice, about 55, I guess, and she likes my poetry. <laughs> and then he mentions, uh, oh, we're going to tea at Ezra Pound's next week. So it's just catching him at that moment where it's all brand new to him, and he is so excited to be there at the, the heart of where things are happening and it the world's the world of art and the world of writing. And he's a, a humble uh, apprentice and just the world is his oyster at that moment. So I, I like that one a lot. Um, in in this particular volume, there, there are just, there are a lot of, of uh, Verna's, the, the letter Verna mentioned is is extremely moving. I, it It is one of my very favorites as well. He also gives some really thoughtful advice to other people about writing and writing was really a subject he he was never cynical about he was never dismissive of it was his sacred subject and he's talking this is a letter that he writes to Arnold Gingrich who's working on a novel this is in August of 1934 and um, Arnold Gingrich is working himself to death, both editing this magazine, this new magazine, Esquire, and trying to to write this novel. And Hemingway's giving him some writerly advice. And one thing he says, the real secret in writing a novel is to keep inside of your action all the time like a horse. Don't let the damned horse run away on you when you're going to have to keep racing him forever. And always stop at an interesting place when you still know what is going to happen. Then you can go on from there the next day and the next and etc. Never write yourself out in these bursts. It is just like making a 300 mile race, a succession of runaways. Do a certain amount every day or every two days and always stop where it is interesting and while you are going good, underlined. And this is a, the same type of comment about writing that he would put in his Paris memoirs, which he was writing near the end of his life about stopping and letting the well refill. But I, I think just his philosophy of writing and, and his generosity in sharing his his tips with, with someone else as well. Are, I, I, I enjoyed reading that. And so this project covers 54 years of Hemingway's life. And so far, the volumes have covered 29 years. And so how have you seen the progression of his career and life as kind of seen through the letters he's writing? One thing that we kind of see 
coming through in, in the progression of letters is early on in the first couple of volumes, you know, he wants to be a writer. He's working as a journalist, but then he, you know, he goes off to Paris and begins that apprenticeship. And there's this sense of a belief in himself that that he's going to be able to to do this work. And like Sandy said, taking the work very seriously from the very beginning. And then as he gradually grows in his fame, you still see that. You see that he, he doesn't take it for granted. He's always working on the next thing. Some of the letters in this volume even talk about how so you had success with one thing, you can't just rewrite the same novel, or you could rewrite the same novel over and over again and sell plenty of copies, but that wouldn't be the right thing to do creatively. And so there's this commitment to his craft, a commitment to constantly being innovative and not giving in to trends. The critics didn't always like what he wrote. And that made him pretty angry. And there's some pretty funny letters where he's mad about that. But he he understands that if he writes for trends, he's going to be trendy and then he'll be forgotten. And he he has his eye on outlasting his critics and outlasting himself. He wants you. You can see even early in his career, he wants to write things that are going to live on beyond himself. And I mean, I guess he was right. He He did manage to do that. You can also see this very ambitious young man and what starts to happen when celebrity overtakes him. And he both wants to be very successful and famous and revels in that, but there's the downside to that. And he really, there's a push-pull thing there about uh, fame and celebrity. Um, during this period, Key West, Florida is is completely... Uh, on the skids. And during the Great Depression, uh, it is actually taken over by the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. Um, there's huge unemployment and the federal government under the New Deal has decided that the way to save Key West is to make it into a tourist attraction. And Hemingway is really very funny in his grumblings about um, all these people coming down and overrunning Key West on their bicycles and looking for artsy things. And his home got put on the the federal uh, federally funded tourist map. It was site number 18, I think. And so people would uh, come by and, and stare into his house. He finally had to put up a, a brick wall around the house for a little privacy. But you you see him the the coping with uh, struggling with the price of celebrity and fame. He's he also is a little thin skinned for somebody as famous as and successful as he is. He takes it extremely personally when he is criticized by someone like Gertrude Stein, who questions his his bravery and his his strength and his vitality. And he also was quite offended uh, after his book, Death in the Afternoon, came out, his book about bullfighting and writing in 1932. There was a very famous piece of criticism uh, by Max Eastman called Bull in the Afternoon, in which uh, Eastman accused Hemingway of having false hair on his chest and posing, doing these masculine poses. And Hemingway was infuriated by that. Later on in volume seven, not to do a spoiler, but <laughs> there's a famous incident where uh, Hemingway and Eastman encounter each other in in the office of Maxwell Perkins and Hemingway picks up a book containing the essay by Max Eastman and smacks Eastman in the face and Max Perkins has to break up the the brawl. But there's one other kind of a letter that's kind of interesting that again totally came out of the blue to us back in 2002. So this is one of the very very earliest letters. A man, uh, well Charles B. Strauss, wrote to us and said uh, he had a, he sent a, a copy of a letter that his father received from Hemingway in 1935, shortly after. Hemingway had written a piece about this horrible Labor Day hurricane um, that killed hundreds of people. Anyway, he Hemingway's very happy to have this letter, and apparently, this uh, the the Charles Strauss, who had just at that time graduated from Dartmouth, uh, had written and with and praised that article in in New Masses called "Who Murdered the Vets," and 
Hemingway writes to him, for a long time, I was awfully disgusted and very sore about the bull and the afternoon guys and the rest of them. I couldn't see how a guy could deliberately lie about you like that. But what the hell? But you can't expect me to trust those guys. I wouldn't tell any of them anything. And I won't ever tell any of them anything. Because the main thing I've discovered so far from what I've seen of some of the things you mentioned is that there's always too much talking. But he goes on to say, which is kind of funny and, and touching, He's basically writing, he's flattered that somebody has written to him just simply to praise something he's written. And uh, he says, I'd like to write some stories for you because you seem to be a well-wisher. And Christ knows, and that's C-H-R-I-S-T, and then a separate word, N-O-S-E, Christ knows. I haven't met a well-wisher in so damn long that I don't even look to see if you are armed. <laughs> so... A lot of the letters are funny. He had a great sense of humor. So it, it, I think Verna would agree. I mean, we all all agree that we have a pretty fun job here reading Hemingway's mail. Yeah, I read the detect between detective work and then just reading these kind of personal correspondences seems like a good time. And I did want to wrap up with um, asking one final question. So about 85% of the letters, I believe, that would be part of the books haven't been published before. Um, so how will having these compiled for you know everybody to read change the view about Hemingway? And has this experience with the Letters Project changed your own view of him? I got into this project, as I said, as, as a grad student, I was interested in working on the Letters Project because I was interested in early 20th century print culture, journalism, and, you know, Hemingway was this figure who was very involved in, you know, novels, war correspondence, short stories. He knew all these interesting people. And so in, in that sense, you know, these letters, they, they have in them what originally drew me to this project. It is a, a really great comprehensive look at the first half of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century literature and print culture, but the letters definitely deepen my understanding of those things and of Hemingway himself, because he he comes through not as the caricature that you see, the, you know, the celebrity icon. That, what's interesting is you see the origins of that. You see the the fighting, the drinking, you know, those sorts of things, but you also see his sense of humor, his uh, concern for family and friends, his willingness to loan anybody money. And he was constantly loaning people money and never getting paid back. And his, uh, you know, you see how he's politically astute. The beginnings of that are are visible in volume six of the letters. And then we really see that during the Spanish Civil War period. And so, you know, it's interesting to work on these letters and to see where his reputation came from. And then to see the more caricature aspects of that get challenged and to, to see someone with more seriousness, more depth, um, at the same time, someone who's a little bit more likable, a little more lovable than the kind of difficult icon he became later in life and, and in our kind of collective understanding of who Hemingway was. Yeah, I would agree with with everything that Verna just said. I mean, it he... He has such a public persona and I, to me, such an unattractive one and a one dimensional one that I, it, it, he's so much more complicated and so much more interesting than that. And he did have a front row seat to 20th century history. He started out as a journalist. He is, he has a very keen eye. He's very politically astute, very interested in revolutionary movements in Cuba in the 30s and what's happening in Spain that's going to be leading up to the Spanish Civil War. He's very interested in art. He bought uh, Miro's The Farm in 1925, and Miro is one of his correspondents. Um, he also, by the way, writes in Spanish and French uh, and Back when he was studying Latin in high school, he wrote in terrible Latin and Italian, too. I actually had a professor here at Penn State who who laughed when I showed her some of Hemingway's Italian when he was in World War One and writing to his sister or trying to impress her with Italian. And 
my friend, the professor here laughed and she said, if you showed that to a, a native speaking Italian, they probably wouldn't know what that was. But she said, I teach 18 and 19 year olds who speak English, Italian. So I know exactly what he's doing and exactly what he means. But he did. He he was out in the world. He was insatiably curious. Even Gertrude Stein, who said mean things about him at, at some point, said uh, he had eyes uh, that were not so much interesting as interested. He had this very intense, interested presence when he came into a room. So I think that we learned so much more about his times through him. He reflected his times and he shaped his times at, simultaneously. So there aren't that many people who are in, in that position. Yeah, it definitely rounds out a picture of a full human being. And I think that's a great value of, of the letters. Well, thank you both. I really enjoyed the conversation and look forward to the sixth volume being out. Congratulations. And then can you just tell us a date where we can expect to buy this this next next volume? The official release date is <laughs> May 16th, and I am told that the books have been physically printed and they are making their way to distribution warehouses. They can be pre-ordered on Cambridge University Press's website. They're on Amazon. This is being published. Um, one thing I'm really grateful to Cambridge University Press about is that these are being produced as trade books, not solely academic books. So our audience is, yes, this is a full-fledged scholarly edition. We have tons of footnotes and all of the apparatus that you would have to have to be published as an academic book by Cambridge University Press, but they are read by a huge range of people. And uh, we try to write it not in an academic way, but to be as interesting and appealing as as Hemingway deserves for the type of writing he did. So they're attractively produced. Cover design is by Chip Kidd, who was sort of the rock star of the book design world. We were very fortunate to be able to get him to do this design for us. Um, there was a Penn State connection there that that caused that to happen. So they're excessively priced for an academic book, many of which sadly cost more than $100 a volume. This is Full price thirty nine ninety nine for the hardback, and then it is also this time uh, and forevermore will be issued simultaneously each volume in in a digital form as well. So yes, A sixteenth is the, the all great right. Date. Okay, well mark my calendar. Well, thank you both so much. Congratulations again, and look forward to future volumes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about what we discussed today, check out our podcast page at jfklibrary.org slash jfk35 for links to the archives and other Hemingway material. If you have questions or story ideas, email us at jfk35pod at jfklfoundation.org or tweet at us at jfklibrary using the hashtag jfk35. If you liked what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast or leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening and have a great day.